Lord, this morning as we come to your word, we echo the words of that song, my feet are firm, held by your grace. You are the rock upon which we stand. You are the the firm foundation. Your truth, your life, your work on our behalf, it's because of you that there's no condemnation. It's because of you that we can look forward to heaven. It's because of you that there is a sanctified work happening in our life to to draw us into greater likeness to Jesus. And it's because of you that we can endure whatever difficulties and challenges this life may throw at us. Not by our strength, not by our power, not by our resolve, not because of, of something in us that is overcoming, but because you're the overcomer. You're the savior. You're the deliverer. You're the helper. You're the stronghold because you are the foundation. You're the foundation for our feet. You're the foundation of our life. And so, Lord, this morning as we look at this passage of Scripture, call attention to the fact that you are that foundation that is faithful and sure and trustworthy. And may we as your people not only be reminded, but be called into greater dependence upon that sure foundation as a testimony to your glory and greatness to the world around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we find ourselves in Nehemiah chapter 7. Nehemiah chapter 7. I would encourage you to turn there so you can look at it for yourself. Nehemiah chapter 7. We dealt with the first three verses, two to three verses last week. We're going to deal with the next 69 verses this morning. Hey, it won't be that bad, I promise you. It won't be that bad. Uh, We might be here till next Sunday, but at least we'll finish. (laughs) Just kidding. Nehemiah chapter 7, and I'm just going to read the first several verses to kind of get a flavor of what we're talking about, where we're going here this morning, okay? Beginning in verse 4, and we'll read till verse 7. It says this, The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few. No houses had been, had been rebuilt. Then my God put it in my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. And I found the book of genealogy of those who came up at the first, and I found written in it, these were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Raamiah, Nehemani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispereth, Bigvi, Nahum, Ba'ana, the number of the men of the people of Israel. And fast forwarding to verse 73. So the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, The singers and some of the people, some of the temple servants and all of Israel, lived in their towns, and when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. Now we come to passages like this, and we're like, okay, let's hit the fast forward, and let's get to chapter 8. Let's get to the good stuff. But for whatever reason, God has decided to capture for us Names that would otherwise be obscure. The identities of individuals who were part of a work, and he has not forgotten. Now, for many of us, uh, the similarity would be uh, watching credits at the end of a movie. How many of you just can't wait for the credits? All right, there's one person up here. Can't wait for the credits. You see this scroll of names and this list of person after person after person. Who, who knew it took so many people to decorate people's faces in a movie? I mean, it's unbelievable the number of individuals who are part of that presentation. But interestingly enough, 
my kids actually ask to watch the credits. Now, it's not because they just love the, the fancy tune at the end of the movie, and not because they really get kicks out of seeing that scroll of names, but, but ever since Pixar, things are a little different in credits, where they give you something to look forward to, right? I can think of, and you probably can help me, like uh, Monsters, Inc. How is it that a cartoon has bloopers? <laughs> Right? I mean, they mess up their lines, and it's, it's, just, it's just a kick, right? Or, or you watch uh, Toy Story, and I think Toy Story also has the, the blooper features at the end. Uh, those of you who love watching Jackie Chan, you have all those stent, stunts at the end where, where he's messed up and gets hurt, and something doesn't go quite the way he, ex- he expects. It gives you an appreciation for the difficulty of the things that he's doing in the movie. And, and of course... Those of us who are now part of the Marvel age for the last 15 years, you know, you, you look forward to the credits at the end because they kind of give you a snapshot of, of what to anticipate, whether it's an Iron Man or Captain America or an Avenger. You, you, you know, we're going to watch, we're, gonna, we're going to endure the credits because we can't wait to watch not just one, but two, and sometimes even three little clips throughout the course of the credits to kind of keep your attention so you can enjoy the scroll of monotonous names. In some respects, chapter 7 is this scroll. This scroll of monotonous names that individuals in this list aren't seen anywhere else in the entirety of of the New Testament, with the exception of a couple. One, of course, this list is also in Ezra chapter 2, but, but, but who, who cares about a scroll of names? Who, who cares about these anonymous people? The answer is, God does. God cares about these anonymous people. And, and, and it wasn't because these people had had some level of resolve that carried them through and they could accomplish this major milestone. Which, by the way, those of us writing the narrative would have spent far more attention on finishing the walls, but the Hebrew captures the completion of the walls in two words. Two Hebrew words. Vatishlam ha-homa. The wall was completed. Because in God's mind, the completion of the wall was a foregone conclusion for people who were obedient. It was in God's mind that the walls would be built because it was in God's mind that the city was going to be built. The question was, who were the people? Who who were the people that were going to be faithful to this great enterprise? Who who were the people that God was going to to use in this great venture, not just to accomplish a major milestone of stacking blocks of stone on top of one another, but but more importantly, who who was going to be a part of this venture of, of really becoming and understanding the identity that God had set on his people? They were God's people. This was God's city. And so the banner across chapter 7 is this. God is faithful. You can trust Him. God is faithful. You can trust Him. And I don't know where you are this morning. I I don't know how how anonymous you feel. I, I don't know how obscure your life seems to be in your own eyes. But if God cares about the people in Nehemiah chapter 7, who you never hear of again, he cares about you. And God is faithful. You can trust him. That's the message this morning. We see that at least four different ways as we walk through our passage. Perhaps maybe not as as pronounced as you might think, but I think you'll see as we look at the passage, as we dissect it for ourselves this morning, these truths will come screaming from the pages. It will be evident to you as you read this chronicle of names that God is faithful and that you can trust Him. And we understand that the Scripture 
as we find in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16. Maybe you kids can quote it with me, those, are, those kids who are part of Awana. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man or woman of God might be equipped, prepared for every good work. God put Nehemiah chapter 7 in the Bible. And God's declaration over this chapter is, it is profitable for you. It's profitable for me. It's profitable as we begin to understand how God has worked in a people, obscure though they may be, to accomplish his purposes. The first truth of of God's faithfulness comes to light in verse 4. It says this, The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. The truth here is, you can trust him when you make God exalting sacrifices. When you make God exalting decisions. And God exalting decisions require sacrifice. God exalting decisions require faith. <laughs> because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so if, if God is, is leading you to a place of pleasing him, it's going to require faith, which requires sacrifice. And that's what we find here in our passage. It, it may not be as apparent to you yet, but let's talk just briefly about these three components. I want to talk about the people I want to talk about the city, and I want to talk about their sacrifice, just briefly, as we walk into this together. First, just understanding the people. If we, if we read through this record of, of names, we find at the very end of this record, in, in verse 66 to 69, we, we find the chronicle of the numbers of the people. It says, the whole assembly together was 42,380 besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337. And they had 245 singers, male and female. Their horses were 736. Their mules were 245. Their camels, 435. And their donkeys, 6,720. Now, you know you're in trouble when you start counting donkeys. You're trying to add to the number, trying to compile how many, how many uh, live beings do we have in this company of individuals. <laughs> and the composite is about 50,000. Here's a, a comparison of the land of Israel. This would be the entire southern and northern tribes of Israel in relationship to Ohio. And then kind of a, an idea of, of the top 10 cities in, in, uh, in Ohio. And it's not until you get to number 10 that you start getting close to this number 50,000. And I don't know, has anyone ever heard of Lorraine? Okay, well, that's good. I've never heard of Lorraine. I'll have to go visit just to say I've been there. In order for a city to thrive, it needs people. In order for a city to be successful, it's got to have people. We only have 50,000 people to work with. And by the way, we have already discovered in this, in this uh, record in genealogy that these 50,000 people are currently occupying a space that is expansive in at least 20 different villages that are recorded for us in Ezra chapter 2, and also in Nehemiah chapter 7. That doesn't leave a whole lot of people to go around, by the way. And it doesn't include all the the spaces in between each of these little villages. It was a a rural environment. When we were studying through Nehemiah chapter 3, we saw the work on the wall, and we saw at least seven or eight different towns that are represented in the building. Men from Tekoa and from Gibeon and Mizpah and Zenoa and Beth Zur, people from greater Judah area and men from, from Jericho. There were, there were a lot of groups of individuals who were coming, kind of rallying to the, the center of Jerusalem to help build this work. It was an important work. 
It was a way for them to represent God's presence among the nations. This, this was the place, the only place on the entire planet where the glory of God, the presence of God was known. It was Jerusalem. And so it was critical, it was, it was essential that God's people represented him effectively and meaningfully in Jerusalem. When we get to Nehemiah chapter 11, we'll see a, a strategy that was put in place. Let me just read it for, for you in, briefly. Nehemiah chapter 11, 1 and 2 says this, Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of ten remained in the other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. We'll talk about the sacrifice in a moment. Let's talk about the city, the city itself. We find from our verse, uh, verse 4, that, that even though the, the city was expansive and the walls were, were finally rebuilt, we, we find that there weren't any homes that had been rebuilt in the city. It doesn't mean that there weren't any homes at all. Those who were living there had homes. We find in Nehemiah chapter 3 as the, the recounting, the, the building of the walls, that some families built walls opposite their homes or in front of their homes. Remember that? And so there were some homes there, but not nearly enough homes to, to help reestablish the, the folks that need to re-inhabit this great city. So what were they going to do? And you know how things get run down over time. Uh, this is a, a picture of a home that is similar to, to a farmhouse that I pass every time I go to Cedarville. And back in the day, back when I was a, a child, this was a, a home that was a symbol of strength. And this was a, a symbol of the place you would want to go as a, as a, as a youngster and, and kind of establish a family. <laughs> but uh, it's not taken long for deterioration to set in. It's not, it's not taking long for, the, for the, the, the roof to collapse and the foundation to crumble and for, the, for the, the things, the vegetation to grow through. It doesn't take long for the elements to have their way. And you can imagine then for a, a city built with stone that, that over about 140 years there's going to be some degradation, some corrosion. And, and here's maybe an example of, of what you could expect. Crumbling structures, stones that, that have been beaten by wind and water and elements over the years. This was certainly a picture of what the people in Jerusalem had to deal with. It was not a place you wanted to live. And then to consider the sacrifice. Although safety wasn't as much of a concern as it had been before, Life in Jerusalem was difficult. There weren't any businesses at the time. There, weren't, there wasn't any buying and selling that was happening in the city. The trade was, was all had been diverted around the city up to this point for the last 90 years, if there was any trade at all. The people who were living there, there was no sanitation. There was no running water. And so that made life difficult. Walking out of the city to find water. Walking out of the city to find produce. Walking out of the city in order to find things to eat for the day. The complexities of living in the city meant that taking up residence there was a strategic decision. It was a decision with a higher objective in mind. It was a decision that focused on the glory of God. A decision that would anchor their heart and mind and, and fix their attention on what really mattered. It wasn't about stockpiling a heritage and, and passing on a legacy to their children. It had in mind a greater objective of, of, of featuring the glory of God and representing the identity and the presence of God among the people of God there in Jerusalem. It would be a significant sacrifice for those of us who are believers in Christ, followers of God. I'm moving through in my own personal devotions, 1 Peter. 
And right there in verses 1 and 2, we find, as nowhere else, a description of the elect. Those who have been called out by God into salvation and were described in two ways, with two words. One, were described as strangers, and secondly, were described as scattered. Wherever you live is not your zip code. Wherever you live is not your residence, at least not your permanent one. Wherever you live is in anticipation of that future citizenship. We are now citizens of heaven. We are now residents of that life, not this one. We have a mission to accomplish while we're here in taking as many people along with us to heaven as we can by sharing the gospel and by praying that God's glory would come down and meet them where they are. But this is not your city. This is not your zip code. You are living for that world, not this one, if you have been purchased by God. And so... As those who have a new residence, as those who have a new hope, as those who are anticipating a a, a real future in heaven with God, how does that begin to, to influence or change the strategic, sacrificial, faith filled living today? I have been so encouraged by the, the ministry in Lafayette, Indiana, Faith Church. You know, you're, you may be aware of that. Pastor Saul's son, Rob, is a pastor there, and that's where the Greens have just went uh, to live, there in Lafayette, Indiana. Well, one of the, the ways that their church, and there are many, but one of the ways their church has taken this strategy to heart is they have a seminary where there are a lot of students who come and who are there, uh, obviously, on a, on a regular basis. And they thought, how can we set up a residence for these students? Their bright idea was, we're going to purchase a building or two in the worst part of Lafayette. (laughs) Come to our seminary, we'll send you to the slums. But that's what strategic, missional, faith-filled living looks like. It understands that there are greater objectives in play. They understand that there are are greater uh, opportunities that are presented to us if we decide to live strategically. They are sending the the gospel to the darkest parts of Lafayette. They're they're sending their mission-minded students where the mission is. (laughs) What a concept! They're looking to transform that city by, with the gospel by, by sending their best and brightest into the, into the areas where they're going to be able to really understand the, the heart and soul of ministry and is this something for me or not? Because if I can't live with a heart of compassion, if I can't live with a, with a posture of ministry among these people, what does God really have to do with me in the future? The heart and soul of of our identity is is a commitment to this truth, this this truth that God is faithful. Wherever you might live, God is faithful and you can trust him. Are you willing to put his faithfulness to the test? Are you willing to to demonstrate to the world that, that he is dependable the way that you say he is? And to show it out in actions, to show it out in in a strategic, intentional life, even in where you live. Maybe targeting areas around Columbus or even around this church where things are difficult so that you can go live with those people and you can show them God's love in a day-by-day exchange, not just uh, dropping in once, paratroop into this little neighborhood, share the gospel and pull out, but you're in for good because God loves these people. That's what faith-filled, sacrificial living looks like. In verse 5, we find another truth that stands out about the faithfulness of God. It, It is this. You can trust him to give you wisdom when you need it. You can trust him to give you wisdom when you need it. Here's what it says. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles 
and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. And I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up at the first, and I found written in it these names. You can trust him to give you wisdom when you need it. But there are a couple of truths that accompany this one. And that is, God gives wisdom to those who ask. God gives wisdom to those who ask. You know that from James chapter 1, verses 5 to 6. It says, if, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. God gives wisdom to those who ask. And it requires a level of intimacy and relationship with God. And certainly, Nehemiah was, was that kind of person. I, I like this phrase, God put it in his heart. It's comparable to what we see earlier in Nehemiah, chapter 2, verse 12, where, where Nehemiah is describing this work, and he says to, to the people of Jerusalem, God put it in my heart to build this wall. Nehemiah was in tune with God's will and direction for his life. And he was in tune with God's will and direction for his life because he was connected to God. That makes sense. You want to hear from God? You've got you to spend time with God. If you want God to, to, to speak to your heart, you need to be in his word. That's, that's where the, the communication comes. If you want to pour out your life to him and, and get answers for things, you need to, to go to him in prayer and, and, and rely on his Holy Spirit to, to lead you into truth through his word. You can't hope to know God's wisdom and direction for your life if you have nothing to do with God in the day or the week. Nehemiah is so in tune with God because he's so connected in relationship and fellowship and intimacy. He loves God and it comes screaming off the page, pages of Nehemiah. It is abundantly clear. And the work of God in Nehemiah's heart here in Nehemiah chapter 7 of, of putting it into his heart gives us a little glimmer of what happened in Ezra chapter 1. This initiating work of God. Great movements happen through people who are connected to God. And that's what happens in Ezra chapter 1, where we find the Lord stirred up Cyrus, king of Persia. We find in Ezra chapter 1 verse 5, Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah, and Benjamin, and the priests, and Levites, everyone whose spirit got it stirred to go up to Jerusalem to rebuild the house of the Lord that's in Jerusalem. Great movements begin from people who are connected to God, who are walking in step with God in fellowship and committed to hear from God and obey God. Nehemiah was that man. We see prayer in Nehemiah chapter 1. We see prayer in Nehemiah chapter 2. We see prayer four times in Nehemiah chapter 4. We see prayer in Nehemiah chapter 5. We see prayer at least two times in Nehemiah chapter 6. <laughs> is there any surprise that God is speaking to Nehemiah's heart and providing direction and guidance and leadership? It happens as we ask and we commit ourselves to depend and know what God says through his word and to, and, to, and to communicate with God through prayer. If you want to know God's leadership in your life, whatever direction he wants you to take, you have to have a relationship with him. So, God leads his heart because Nehemiah is a man who has asked for help. But God leads his heart because he's leading him into greater obedience. You can trust him to provide direction for you when you are stepping into greater obedience. That's what God desires for you. God desires to sanctify your heart. He, he desires to, to lead you into likeness with Jesus. 
He, he, he desires for, for your life to, to reflect more and more the, the glory of God through your life and actions and words. That's what we learned at the beginning of, of this whole, this, this year. We're looking at renewal. We saw in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that it's the Holy Spirit who, who is working to, to transform you from one degree of glory to the other. And essentially what that means is that you look more like God tomorrow than you did today. Not because of greater effort in your life, but because of greater surrender in your life to Him. Greater commitment to obedience and the work of the Spirit in your life. But if... If God's wisdom leads you to greater obedience, what does that mean about what preceded it? What does that mean? There must have been obedience before, right? He can't lead you to greater obedience. He can't, he can't encourage you to take another step unless you've been faithful with the previous ones. That's why the psalmist says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. By God's grace, he doesn't overwhelm you by giving you the whole formula of what your life is going to look like. It is beyond you. You're unable to deal with that. So what he does is graciously give you that next step. And so faith is a step into the, into the light. It's being led by obedience to God and, and discovering what he says in his word and, and faithfully taking the step that he's asked you to take. And you can't hope to take step 20 without steps 1 through 19. You can't jump there. You have to be faithful today if you intend and, and, and hope for God to, to lead you into more truth and guidance for the future. Will you be faithful? Are you faithful? To being led into greater obedience as God takes delight in revealing himself to you. Yeah, isn't that spectacular that God has, has given to us his word because he wants you to know his will. He's given you his spirit because he wants to open and illuminate your eyes. He doesn't want to conceal his, the, 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 the intentions that he has for you. He, he wants to open it wide, up, wide open for you. Will you ask and will you obey? Will you trust him? Because God is faithful. You can trust him. Verses 6 to 72 provide this truth. That you can trust him to honor his promises even when life takes a turn you don't expect. You can trust him to honor his promises even when life takes a turn you don't expect. Verses 6 and 7 says this, These were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity, those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. Let's just stop there. They're coming up out of captivity. They're coming up out of slavery. They're coming to their own, their own home territory. They're coming back to their villages, back to their farms, back to their cities, back to their place of worship. And what do you think is on their mind? Huh? Freedom! This is amazing! Wow! I can't wait! This is going to be spectacular! And I, and I think of the... I think it's a, a psalm. I, I don't know exactly where it is, but... but um, the, the psalm goes something like this, where it says, sing us those songs of, of Babylon, right? And they're like, how can we sing the songs of, uh, of Jerusalem? How can we sing those songs of celebration when we're in captivity? But now they've come back and they are ready to explode. In their minds, this was supposed to be the good life. This was supposed to be the good life. We're finally free. We can finally be the people that God has called us to be. We can finally uh, build an income and, and pass on a legacy to our, to our children. We can, we can finally enjoy the, the, the great parts of, of interacting with one another as a people. But all of that was ruined in the first couple of years. And for the next 90 plus years of living in Israel. They were marked by shame. 
They were marked by distress. They felt like they were slaves. They were oppressed and manipulated, intimidated, threatened, and even killed. Sold into slavery. They were poor. Life was terrible. This was not the life they expected. In Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 36 and 37, here's how they kind of encapsulate their experience. We are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit. You know, we're, we're back here, but we feel like slaves. Behold, we are slaves, and it's rich kings whom you have set over us. They rule over our bodies, over our livestock as they please. And we are in great distress. Nothing has changed. That's because God had a greater objective in view. It wasn't about the good life now. The objective that God had in mind was a good life in God, not a good life in Jerusalem. That life could only be found in God. And so God has to, has to systematically strip away all of the things that they're, that they're finding satisfaction in, pulling it away from them so they can finally come to terms with what really matters, finally come to terms with the kind of life they're supposed to have. And that was a life that was anchored and, and focused on, on the, the God of heaven, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with the glory of God as center stage and worship of God as, as the, as the all-encompassing reality of their life. How do I know this? It's apparent in the record of names. Let me just put this up on the screen for you. This is the record of names in Nehemiah chapter 7. And look where God concentrates his attention Although the numbers of people are all focused up into that first category of people, God draws attention to the areas of worship. God features the things that make worship possible. God draws their attention to, to the things that really matter, the, the focus of, of Him, relationship with Him. And that's why they're coming back to Jerusalem. They're coming back to build the temple. They're coming back to make the glory of God known. They're coming back to be a people that represent God on this earth. And so he calls attention to the priests. He calls attention to the Levites, to the temple servants and Solomon's servants. And the mercy of God is on display with those who, whose record is unavailable. They weren't cast out. They weren't rejects in that they could not be considered part of the body. It was their commitment to the God of heaven that was the, the overarching uh, requirement, the, the, the only feature, the only characteristic that mattered in, in being called part of this people, even though they couldn't look at heritage, they couldn't look at ancestry, they couldn't prove that the, the records were in their favor. But all that mattered was a, a commitment to the worship and glory of God. And that's what is put on display through this passage. You can trust him to honor his promises even when life takes a turn you don't expect. And I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what challenges you're facing. I, I don't know whether or not you feel like God is distant from you. Maybe he's forgotten you in some way. The hardships that you're going through, the, the challenges that you're enduring, the, the, the fracture in relationships, whatever it might be, the, the crisis that you're going through right now, God seeks to make himself the center of your life. He is after not the good life here. He's after good life in him as he seeks to, to direct your attention to, to, the, to the next life, the, the next world, the things that really matter and, and gives you the opportunity to count it all joy when you fall into various trials so that your life can be a gospel witness to the, the people around you. They can see what really matters as they see things stripped away from you, but a sustained joy and faith in God to carry you through hard times. Finally, in verse 73, we come to this truth. 
You can trust him to accomplish his purposes at the perfect time. You can trust him to accomplish his purposes at the perfect time. Here's what it says, verse 73. So the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, temple servants, and all of Israel lived in their towns. And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. You know, I think about God's promises. It's better than Amazon Prime. God promises and God delivers. God is faithful to come through at just the right time. And he will always come through at just the right time. I'm reminded of the New Testament passage that says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son. God is never late. He's never ahead of time. The the timetable that God has set for you, for your life, is always perfect. Trust him, because his timing is always perfect. He wants to accomplish something significant significant in you. And he wants to maximize your usefulness where you are. So what's the significance of this verse in relationship to the perfect time? Well, there are two things. First, it corresponds with the first return. That's the the first perfect cadence of of this passage. It, It corresponds perfectly with the first return. We'll look at that in just a moment. Second, it corresponds with the seventh month, and that is also significant. We're going to pick that up and walk that through starting next week. You'll see the significance of that. But this first month of the return, or this first return, happens in exactly the same time as the completion of the walls. You're you're almost at a place in this passage in Nehemiah chapter 7 where you have forgotten that Nehemiah has actually just lifted Ezra chapter 2 and placed it in Nehemiah chapter 7, almost word for word. And so the end point of the passage ends exactly where you would expect it to end if it was about Nehemiah chapter 7. Nehemiah has come. He started in the first month of the, of the year. He comes and shows up, and about four months later, and it takes him two months to build the walls, and now at the end of the sixth month, we're done, and we're ready for month, chap- month seven. It happens to coincide and correspond with exactly the purpose of God of bringing his people back and having them anticipate the seventh month. It is almost God's declaration, his bookends. Ezra chapter 2, Nehemiah chapter 7, where God says emphatically, okay, now, mission accomplished. And it has very little to do with the, with the walls and everything to do with establishing a people. Because God cares about people. And it's a declaration of God's faithfulness. I promised that I would establish the people. Here's the proof. Here's the proof. Just look around. Look around and see that I'm faithful. I have gathered for myself a remnant, and I will continue to accomplish my purposes in their life. And finally, it corresponds with the seventh month. And this is a significant, the most significant religious month on the Jewish calendar. It it includes not one or two, but three special holidays that all feature the work of God in the people of God. The first being the Day of Atonement, where the one time a year where the The high priest moves into the Holy of Holies and he atones for the people. It is a recognition that only God can do that work. Only God can call out his people. God is faithful. He delivers. It was also a commemoration of the the Feast of Tabernacles. This was the God bringing the people out of Egypt and and carrying them through the the wilderness and, and settling them into the promised land, that that God carries us through hard times, but he will deliver. His promises stand. He is faithful. You can trust him. And I don't know where you are this morning. Do you even have a relationship with God? Have you even taken that initial step of saying, God, it's becoming clear to me. I see now who you are. I want to give my life to you. I want to take that first step of committing myself in faith to you. 
in beginning this journey, this journey of faith, walking in step and trusting you with every moment. Or maybe you have been a believer for, for many years. And there have been ups and downs. There have been challenges that have confronted you. But you know in your heart of hearts that God is faithful and you can trust him. Maybe this morning you need to to reassert that truth claim in your heart and say, I am anchoring my soul in this truth. Oh God, please help me to make this a reality for the sake of your glory and the people around me. If that's true, after I pray, I would just encourage you to come and and just share with me what God is doing in your heart. Give me an opportunity to pray with you or others who are here so we can move in the direction of faith in God and showing Christ to the nations. Let's pray. Lord, it is our desire not just to know these truths intellectually, but to anchor our hearts in them and our lives in them, our actions and words in them from day to day. May we put you on display, not only through our confession, but through our life. Give us the joy of seeing a harvest of souls whom you came to redeem and ransom for yourself. May we be part of that that privilege. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming this morning. God bless you this week as you show Christ to others.